Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today is Tuesday, May 25th. And the only reason I know that is because it's on my screen and your screen right now. Um, this is all Thane SOPA. Tuesdays at two o'clock. Uh, I will say that next Tuesday we will not have a meeting. So following up on the Memorial Day weekend, uh, we will not have a meeting on June 1st, but we will uh, return on June 8th. Um, I think I extended out the Zoom link um, to uh, be for every Tuesday through July, except for June 1st and whatever the July first week of July after the uh, 4th of July holiday. Um, so it should be the same link that you've been using every time you registered. Um, so if somebody can verify that and try to join the link for next month, um, we'll do that at some point. But um, here I go off script and, and so I'm already rambling. Um, the recordings are available at um, the YouTube playlist that's on the resources page, but also you can access it directly here. Uh, so that's available to you. And then as always, contact information for me is on uh, this slide. So it's always available to you. It's also in my signature on my email. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to schedule a meeting, email me. Um, any of those uh, are the preferred method. Um, usually a phone call will go to voicemail just because I'm in and out of meetings. And so the best thing to do is the click on the schedule a meeting button um, and grab a time off my calendar and uh, we can have a conversation. So we're using Slido. So we're at the end of May. How did we get here? Um, If we went back and looked at some of the webinars, we could look at, at um, lower average score of like 2.5, 2.2. Um, so the average score is 3.3, .3, so that's good. Um, so thank you for sharing that and for, um, and we'll hopefully get the ones and twos up to um, at least a three or a four as we move along in the process. And good, you're already sharing questions and we will definitely uh, come back to those as we move along. So please add those questions in there and, and let. So the first question uh, for a lot of people is just what is SOPA? Um, and this is a reference pay or a web page that has that information. And I'm just gonna click out of the slideshow real quick and show you this web page and where exactly that information is. So you have to scroll down a little bit to get to the SOPA information because SOPA is not the only data privacy law, um, but it is the most important one right now um, because we're trying to get data privacy agreements for all the things that are related to data privacy in, um, in student data. So uh, the resources here are good for you to have conversations with in um, different environments, whether it's with your staff, whether it's with your administration, whether it's with your board, these resources will help having those conversations. So please utilize these resources. Utilize the third-party resources too from Robin Swartz. I need to add the recording from last week's webinar, but it's part of the um, slideshow as well. Uh, but just ways for you to get more information about what SOPA is and what we need to do. Looking at stats for this week, um, again, just a steady growth of 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 districts that are participating. The difference between the unique districts with DPAs, we have almost 300 now. So we're getting pretty close to half of the districts um, are utilizing this in some way, whether that's at least testing uh, the system, uh, sampling, putting agreements in, whether or not they really have those agreements or not, but just clicking on the create exhibit E to see what happens or putting uploading an agreement just to see what happens. So um, that's positive that we keep seeing this number go up as well. It's not just the same 27 districts that started um, four months ago and um, 
but we actually have districts that are putting in information and, and moving uh, that number up. And then also this 6,300 uh, number shows the number of agreements that are in the database. Again, those can be originating agreements. They can be subscribing uh, agreements, which would be the Exhibit E, piggybacking, whatever those terms that we want to use are. Um, and then they can just be one-off agreements that people have in there as well. Um, Ultimately, it could be, and I guess this is something else that we haven't really talked about, but it could be just a PDF document that you've created that you want to put in there as additional information that can be there for you to look at. Um, so that's another option there. Um, the originating DPAs, that's just the number of agreements that are with different Resources, they could be the same resource that has a different type of agreement with it. Maybe there's an exhibit H that's different with the same resource, or maybe um, it's a version one versus a 1A agreement. So uh, just some different things there that can be um, available and feel free to use these graphs and different things if you need different pictures or something to share with your um community uh, to show what's going on around uh, the state with regards to data privacy agreements, feel free to grab these uh, resources. Another thing we do each week is just share out the latest agreements that have been uploaded and original agreements are in there that would have exhibit ease um, because that's the way they were uploaded into the database as originating agreement. So, um, this is a reference for you to look at. And then also you can look at the uh, archived uh, sheets or agreements as well to see what else is in there um, as far as you can look at. Um, this is a slide that I shared last week um, and I will um, direct the timestamp for this webinar, I will include that to the last week's conversation. Uh, I did update the slide a little bit just to include a couple different things, uh, but basically just trying to uh, lay out what it means to have an originating agreement that the vendor completes it and signs the full agreement. The vendor also signs the exhibit E to allow subscribing LEAs. Uh, the district signs the full agreement uh, and the district verifies the contents of the agreement for completeness and accuracy. And then they upload that into the database so that other people can piggyback on that agreement or subscribe to that agreement. Uh, the subscribing process is very similar in the fact that really the district reviews that originating agreement that's posted for a particular vendor. And then they sign off on the exhibit E and uh, send that exhibit e to the vendor. So, um, and then the standalone agreement basically means it could be the Illinois NDPA without uh, an agreement. Um, and now that I'm reading my notes and uh, that's not necessarily the case as far as district uploads agreement as other agreement type, that wouldn't necessarily be the case. That would only be the case if it's not the Illinois NDPA agreement. Um, it's, if it's something that the vendor sends to you that's just a one-off agreement that they want you to sign, uh, that would be as another agreement. But you could upload, you could have sent the Illinois NDPA agreement template to a vendor. They could sign off on that, but not include an exhibit E that would be a, a, a piggybacking situation. So they, you could upload that as an Illinois NDPA agreement. Um, and again, if I just confused a lot of people, I'm sorry, I will. Um, I can answer those questions at some point if we need to clarify. Um, again, this is a good resource and, and a couple questions have come up this week, uh, specifically about this bottom number 22, row 22, uh, compressing the files. Uh, the files are coming back from whether it's a vendor or coming back from wherever in the PDF document is just has gotten bigger as it's been passed back and forth. Uh, for whatever reason, I don't really understand PDF uh, technology all that well, but um, ultimately, if you reduce the size, uh, you can upload those documents and you can either do that through Acrobat or uh, through um, 
that website that's listed there. So that's available to you to uh, do to compress the symptoms that where this is the case is when you are uploading a original agreement, uh, the full document, uh, if it's larger than eight megabytes, usually it's going to air, not really air out. It just comes back to the same screen and you see the same information you just did before you submitted it. Um, and the PDF file is not in the, the um, box for uploading that file. So um, if you do encounter that, it's because the um, file's too big. But definitely check out these uh, checklists and I will also try to include the link that I went through this originally uh, to share that with you. But that's a good reference to the uh, what needs to be in the agreement. Uh, also, there's uh, resources in the other uh, videos that are available to you. Uh, tips and suggestions. Um, just continue to add feature enhancements. Um, Again, I'm on a weekly call with the project team from SDPC to talk about what's going to happen and wh what enhancements are going to be made over what time period. So the more suggestions that are available to the team uh, is beneficial. Uh, as far as resources, be sure to check out and al always see what's going on here. I kind of rearrange things. And so if you're used to where things are at, I'm just like a grocery store trying to move things around so you find something else as you're looking for the one thing that you really need. Um, navigation over here for navigating the web, the um, database tools. If you don't have an account yet, join the ISPA that gets you an account in the database that allows you to uh, manage your agreements. And that's mainly what we're talking about here is managing the agreements within the database. Um, also, the three PDF documents for getting started are right here. Uh, I moved the Illinois NDPA down a little bit, but the, uh, the DPA template is here for version 1A. Uh, we did move from version 1 to 1A, so there are some um, agreements that may be in the database that are 1O, and this document would help your uh, attorney to see what the changes were from 1.0 to 1.A and determine whether or not they want you signing on to 1.0 documents or 1.0A documents. Uh, the checklist that I referenced in the previous slide is here. So I have added that to the list and then um, other things that are on this page. The reasonable security practices is here and also um, the YouTube playlists I kind of just made the naming a little bit different using the SDPC database YouTube playlist is here that has all the tutorial videos as well as uh, a couple one hour sessions that I did uh, a few Mondays ago. Uh, one was managing the DPA. So taking you through the database system, menu system and showing you what all the different options were. Those are those two sessions. Those are the same. Um, and then um, this one is about the Illinois NDPA. So if you just want to if you take that checklist and, and work through this video, that would be helpful too. Also with, um, with these videos, you can go to settings and playback time and make them faster. And it actually sounds like I talk like a, a normal person as opposed to slow and deliberate when I'm doing these <laughs> webinars. So if, if you speed them up, I sound a lot better. I don't sound necessarily like a, a chipmunk, but I um, actually sound like I'm uh, alive. Um, <laughs> uh, other resources that are on this page, so the navigation, the YouTube playlist, the PDF, the, all the upcoming events. Uh, so those should be scheduled out there on the, I can't see that link um, because I clicked. Uh, so the All Things Open should be scheduled out. Uh, so yeah, skip July 6th and June 1st. 
but everything else should be there. Um, you don't necessarily, if you're, if you're in this session, you don't necessarily have to register for any future things. The Zoom link should work, but if you um, have not attended one of these and want to attend one, uh, if you're just watching on the recording, you would have to register to get the Zoom link. All right. A uh, couple examples of the documents that are available to you. So the getting started document is there. And then the um, YouTube playlist is there. Uh, here's the link for the recording of the Robin Schwartz webinar. Um, just a quick show of hands. If you attended that webinar, I'd be interested in if you did, if you can use the emoji uh to raise your hand or thumbs up or whatever that'd be awesome um and if anybody wants to put in the chat that um whether or not i uh if they had different stories than what i have or different answers than what i have um i'm i don't think i, I listened to it uh, and i listened to it at to time speed, so I might have missed a couple things, but um, I think that's my preferred way of listening to things about SOPA. Um, so uh, again, ISB update. This is about the model, the policies that are available to you through press. So those should all be available to you, uh, whether you're a press subscriber or not. Uh, you should be able to get access to that. So that's available. Uh, the SOPA for Teachers webinar that we did um, first week of March, so that's almost three months ago already, um, is available to you. The slide deck's available to you. So feel free to use that kind of stuff in there. Um, And then just as far as upcoming events, besides the SOPA stuff, we're also doing some talking about uh, what IT projects you're doing this summer. So everything doesn't have to revolve around SOPA. Um, I heard somebody talking this morning that they were doing a, a VoIP update, a paging update, a new computers for their teachers and uh, all those things and they're a one person shop. And so it was just interesting to relive that idea of what summer means to uh, tech people and, and supporting uh, technology in schools. Uh, and just the other connection, we're, we're getting ready to roll out a, a district documentation guide, assessment guide. Um, and so uh, it'd be interesting to have conversation around what that's going to look like and um, what options are going to be available to you. And then we re and we're going to do those on Wednesday. Sorry. Um, so this week will be on or next week will be on Thursday, but uh, starting in June, we're going to move them to Wednesday afternoons. Um, and we rescheduled a Microsoft webinar that the speaker wasn't able to be there. Um, so that's on June 18th. Uh, at nine o'clock. And if you've already registered, you should be good to go there. And then all of our events uh, for the LTC are available at this link, including webinars by Mindy Fiscus about E-rate, as well as um, all the stuff that the RETCs are doing around um, Google certification and VR and drones and all 3D printers and all those good things. Uh, the IT Summer Summit, uh, this is really an abbreviated version of the IT Summer Summit, but we'll, we're getting together for two, a couple hours on uh, June 15th, just as a way to connect people and, and get uh, a little bit of learning happening. Um, and it's really IT this year is really instructional technology as well as information technology. Uh, and so there's a little bit for everybody, a little bit for teachers, a little bit for instructional technology people, curriculum people, and even uh, technical people, which is really what it's focused on most every year. Uh, and hopefully next year we'll get back to face-to-face -to -face IT summer and showcase stuff. Um, so I know this is always a question and I think I already saw it in the um, Q&A when we just flashed through it. Um, Google, Microsoft, Apple, and Adobe 
um, are kind of those big ones that we talk about, but, and I even saw in the chat that somebody was talking about Pear Deck and Prodigy and, and different things like that. So those are always conversations. There's always going to be somebody that's going to say, we're not going to sign the agreement or we're going to do it this way. And, and, um, and that's okay. Um, the law is right now that we have to have a written agreement, what that looks like. Uh, as far as our written agreement, that's going to be up to uh, district attorneys to determine what that's going to look like and what districts are going to be okay with. Um, Google, I sent out another message to, um, and I'm, I'm communicating with Annie Nash. Uh, a lot of you know her um, with Google. She covers the state of Illinois um, and just... I just wanted to ping her to see if we could definitely have an update by June 8th. Um, I just did that today. So I don't have an update with that other than just kind of knowing that Google has been talking about July 1st as being their kind of deadline um, to have something in place. So the conversations are going on. They're going on at the national level as well as the state level. So hopefully I'll have something for June 8th to give you uh, more information and um, you know Beth says cutting it kind of close but I think there's going to be a lot of situations like that where I mean it, Google makes it see it is big enough and and prevalent enough within the state that is always going to be um, kind of the focus of different things um, Microsoft I saw on the IETL list and then also another school district had reached out to me uh, last week um, and also uh, talk, seeing conversations with the Microsoft team um, that works with ILTPP, uh, that they have an agreement uh, with school districts or with a, a school or maybe multiple schools for review of the Illinois NDPA. Um, so that, that is in process and hopefully that'll come about soon. Um, Apple, um, the latest I have from them is that they want to do something with Apple School Manager and how districts um, agree to something there. Again, that's going to be up to district attorneys to figure out what it is that we need to have as far as what the written agreement is going to look like uh, that would be posted on our sites. Um, and then I don't have an update really from Adobe other than we did have some conversations with an Adobe reseller um, that I need to follow up on. All right. So on to other questions. Um, Google update. That's all I got for that. Um, if software and so a lot of these in a lot of these are similar questions to um, things that came up in uh, the Robin Schwartz thing, uh, our webinar. Um, and hopefully, like in general terms, I know at some point we get very specific about asking about specific um, things, but um, there's really some categories that things are going to follow into. Uh, software is not intended for K-12 education use and not marketed as such games, but they ask for student email, are they bound by SOPA? Ultimately, they're not. And, and ultimately, that is what came across in the uh, Robin Schwartz. Like that was one of the things that they kept coming back to. Is it intended for K-12 educational use? Um, So they're not bound by SOPA, but I come back to just because they're not bound by SOPA, are we not going to worry about what they're doing with the data and, and all those types of things? So um, if they're not bound by SOPA, that means you don't have to have a written agreement with them or post it on your website. But should we be concerned about what the data is that's being shared with them and um, what they have and what they could do with it and all that kind of stuff. I know um, one of the examples that was used, I don't know if it was used during that webinar or something else that I've been a part of, um, but like the Nike tracking apps, like it's not a, it's a general use thing. 
Um, but if you have like, there's all kinds of levels of conversations we could have about that as far as are you, uh, do you have that on, um, are you requiring kids to log in and, and use something to track their, their fit, physical fitness and, and their steps and all those types of things? And then are you pulling that in as a teacher and using that information? Um, and so, and, and using Nike is probably not a good example, but just in general, some kind of physical app that is used um, and you're tracking student data with that and it's tied to that particular student and it's part like you can see kind of where I'm hopefully you can see where I'm going with that is that just because it's not k-12 educational use do we need to be concerned about whether or not um what data is being shared and what that data is and what they're going to do with it and all those types of things so uh, at, at some level, at least knowing what the data is that's being shared with those applications is a minimum. Uh, whether or not you need a data privacy agreement with them or not, that's, um, I don't, I think that's a bigger, that's, that's not the biggest question. The biggest question is, what is the data that's being shared? Um, and do they have access to the data and can they uh, tie that to a particular student or even if if they can't tie it to a particular student um, what are they using it for and those types of things so um, I think I answered that question maybe different ways as I answered it but uh, I think there's a lot of ways to answer that um, if a site offers login options, but students do not log in, do we need a NDPA? I'm thinking about sites like Kahoot. Um, again, there's a lot of levels to questions like this. Um, do you know whether they're logging in or not logging in? Um, that would be one question. Um, so, I mean, do you have the capabilities of keeping them from logging in? Um, ultimately, I'm gonna just from having, and I, and I answer these questions with full idea of what it would take to do some of this stuff. Um, like, it's not just, oh, we'll get a DPA with Kahoot or can I block Kahoot? logins and and all those types of things like i know that's not it's not just a clear-cut easy answer but um i feel like if you're if you're parsing that to figure out whether or not you need an ndpa it's probably goes to the bigger um question uh also i think one of the questions that was asked um so just student logging in uh if they log in with anonymous or a randomized login or whatever, that was one of the questions that was brought up at the Robin Schwartz um, session. And ultimately they kind of fell on the side of, yes, you're still gonna need to have a uh, an agreement with them if it's, even if it's a randomized uh, non-identifiable login or whatever, because ultimately you can tie that information back in some way uh, to that, um, especially if it's a K-12 oriented um, application. Um, and I think that kind of brings up with the Epic. Is anyone getting anywhere with Epic? My teachers will revolt without it. I know that was a conversation on a networking meeting, round table meeting this morning that um, people are checking into that. Um, school districts are looking into that. And ultimately, those are going to be conversations that you have to have at the district level to know, are you going to use that application or are you not going to use that application? Uh, what is the um, risk evaluation, for lack of better term, um, to, to think about whether or not we should use that app or not use that app? And, um, then ultimately, can you block it in a way that they couldn't use it? That that's a whole nother conversation. Um, so, 
but as far as I know, uh, people are concerned about Epic. And so that may be another one that we need to add to that list, growing list of Google, Apple, Adobe, Microsoft. Uh, per the Robin Schwartz, they made it sound like SOPA doesn't apply to non-educational sites like dictionary.com and LinkedIn. Can we get clarification? Ultimately, yeah. If it's, a K, if it's not intended for K-12, if it's not marketed towards K-12, then ultimately you shouldn't need a data privacy agreement with that. Should you be concerned about data privacy when you're using sites like that? Um, absolutely. And so that's where that distinction between what we're doing for SOPA, having written agreements for K-12 intended sites is different than data privacy in general and what we're trying to protect our students from. So, and that really kind of just made a lot of sense in my head that I made that connection. So, and I may not have ever put it that way. Uh, if coaches or club sponsors use technology programs, huddle game changer for sports with students, must I include those in my resources? Again, it's one of those things that um, it's, are it, it just it just really depends like i don't i don't know how to answer other than that because it just it really um especially like I, i'm trying to think of how huddle or game changer works in the sense of how you're inputting that data like i know i use game changer with my daughter's summer league team and it's got all of her statistics it's got her first and last name it's got her school number or her team number um it's got statistics going all the way back to when she was eight years old so um that's a lot of data to have in there and and i don't know how that impacts her in the long run but um i guess i would err on the side of trying to get a dpa or seeing what other people are doing with those particular apps uh, and that's something that can be done if you, if you have questions about how to find those types of things. Uh, we, those tutorial videos should be able to help with that as well. Um, but feel free to ask if um, there's particular applications that you're concerned about and we can do that. Uh, any update from ISB, what a parent data request would look like? Not to this time um i will reach out and see if we can get uh our uh, i just saw eric's name pop up here and i'll let him answer that if he wants to yeah i can if you'd like um yep. so we have a couple of we, we need to issue some rule administrative rules regarding these requests for the legislation it's the final section of the, of the law um so we've We've had a number of these uh, proposed ideas out for public comment. We received a number of public comment um, things in there. So we revised some uh, of those rules based on that comment. We had a number of people show up at the last board meeting to comment on those. Um, so at this point right now, we're waiting to get final approval from um, JCAR, which is the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules, uh, to approve the, um, uh, the rules that we've made up. Um, at this point right now, just in general, once they're approved, they'll be under Title 23, Part 380 under the Illinois Administrative Rules if you go to the um, ILGA.gov website. But in general, right now, um, the requests are going to have to be in writing. Uh, they'll have to be signed and dated. Um, there'll be a 45-day window which in which these requests will need to be responded to, so that's why we want in writing, signed, and dated. Um, the requests are only going to cover the students and also if there's any um, requests for data sets or something involved other students the parent only gets to see their students um, and we're also hoping to well let's sorry and this is kind of still in, in a draft form we've also got some language too about um, you know whether or not it needs to be provided electronically or on paper um, at this point right now we're just waiting for approval from JCAR but in general uh, it's going to have to be a, a written form. Um, as far as that written form, um, you know, we could look at 
for writing on maybe a template or something, but in general, uh, it'll probably be something where the, the form will have to identify the parent um, and then the student are asking the information on what exactly they're requesting, um, signed and dated. And then from that point on, you tend to have 45 days to respond uh, to the uh, requester with that information. Hope that answers yeah. the question. Yep, and I think that would be beneficial to have um, a template form and, and some different things as well to, to those things, so. Yeah, um, we, could, we could work with you guys on that yep. or, or we can come up with it ourselves, and, yeah. Yeah, we can definitely make Talk sure we get that. Um, we'll, we'll provide an update to the group here as far as the, um, when these things will be posted uh, and approved by JCARD and go into effect. Again, we, um, based on some of the comments we've gotten, we may need to go back and maybe do some more tweaks to it. So again, that's something that okay. we're still working on, but uh, at the very least and stuff, the requests will have to be uh, done in, in, in some sort of written form, um, whether that could be like a online like web form or, or via email and stuff. I'm not 100% sure on that yet. Uh, something I guess we can take a look at, but uh, at the, yeah. as it stands right now, our current draft has it in writing. Okay. Thank you, Eric. Mm -hmm. Um, so continuing on here, some districts have an NDPA listed, but the exhibit E is not signed by the vendor, so we can't use that, right? I am talking specifically about GoGuardian. So that that would be the case. I mean, um, if, if there's errors or something's not exactly right, signing on to that with an exhibit E uh, ultimately means that you're signing on to something that is not exactly right or if you signed an exhibit e that's not signed by the vendor then they're really not allowing you or they haven't completed the the agreement properly and so uh those are things that um i keep saying that we're going to have a process for um doing and i haven't completed that process yet but um i have those written down and i have some emails from people sharing those with me and i appreciate that uh, during and and I heard this as well, and I, and I just so during the Robin Schwartz, they alluded to we need to ha have a DPA for state testing, such as AR IAR. But on here, it sounds like ISB would be required to do so. Um, my main reason for saying that it would be difficult for you as a school district to get an agreement on IAR with Pearson is that you don't have that relationship with Pearson in the sense of IAR. You're not sending them the data officially. The Illinois State Board of Education through SIS is sending that information. Um, so I feel like that data privacy agreement is between the state and, and don't take Chris Worley's <laughs> opinion over Robin Swartz or over uh, your legal attorneys, but um, that agreement will be, there will be an agreement between ISBE and Pearson, or there should be some kind of agreement, whether it's contractual or whatever, that you should be able to point to as a school district to say that your information's there. And I hear Eric in the background. Is we'll he... see if we can get some more clarification <laughs> to you guys okay. on that one because we're getting that yep. question a lot ourselves. But yep. uh, again, with the caveat and the, and the disclaimer that I am not a lawyer, cannot speak on legal yep. terms, what I'm about to say is not legal advice. <laughs> pretty much echoing, <laughs> cry to play one on YouTube, pretty much echoing what Chris was saying. Um, it would be, from a logistical standpoint, extremely difficult for all um, testing entities in Illinois. And not just for the IAR, but we're also talking right. about all the other ones too, uh, to develop um, you know, their own agreements with the various testing firms. There's more than just Pearson and then have those things in there. The law is pretty specific that uh, the three main groups that this is targeted towards the operators, you know, the vendors, um, the school districts, and us, ISB. And so ISB has to also publish all the same things that you guys are going to have to do yeah. in terms of our contracts, our vendors, our data sets, why we're collecting it, what we're using it for. So I agree with Chris that I think that the that this is just me talking that I, I Eric Rocky believe that uh, this is probably more on ISBE's thing again but I'll see about getting some definitive um, word from ISBE as to what the school's responsibilities are regarding uh, contracts with the with those vendors but again 
Uh, yes, the law states that you don't have to have an agreement um, between yourselves and ISB, but does that exemption cover all the districts for things like uh, state mandated systems like Pearson for IAR and for um, what's right. the other one for the WIDA test? I forget. It's a can University of Kansas. DRC. Um, DRC. Yeah. For the, yeah. yeah. Yep. So there's there's a there's a few systems and there's also some um, pretty esoteric ones too. There's a, there was also a question about like Harrisburg project for special ed. Uh, um, yep. So yeah, <laughs> we're still the, um, we're still trying to figure that out ourselves in terms of the. Um, where things kind of lie and what exactly um, the definitions mean for the different entities or things like that. But I, uh, at this point, I would kind of agree with Chris. But again, I, I, I'm not saying that to just say, well, as we said, that, um, you know, I'm kind of agreeing with Chris's interpretation. But I'll, I'll seek to, if we can get some clarity and then update the group here. Yep, access uh, is another one that's in there, ISA. Uh, we'll see if we can get some clarity that uh, um, from legal uh, here at ISB as to what responsibilities, if any, school districts might have with those vendors. But um, I'm kind of hoping for everyone's sake is I think it to be logistical, it would be very difficult logistically to, to have everybody try to get agreements with those testing vendors when it is is the, is the one that signed the contracts uh, for those tests. So yeah, again, that's yeah. just me talking. Uh, yep. <laughs> When I put my official ISB hat on and make a statement, I'll let everyone know that. But yeah, that's right now, everything I just said was just me. But I'll see what I can do to find some answers for y'all. I'll, I'll trim that out and make sure that you said it as I no. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. to do anything, right? No, I didn't say that at all. That was just, no. no. that out. I didn't say that. No. Good that uh, you're just on here and sharing that. So. Yeah. Um, so going on here, are Pear Deck and Google Classroom considered under the Google umbrella, or do we need separate agreements? You will, as far as I know, Pear Deck is not a Google um, company, um, so that would be definitely under a different um, solution. But I think Pear Deck and Go Guardian are together, but ultimately those need to be separate agreements probably as well, or at least the company. Uh, another example is Nearpod and Vocabulary. Um, they're kind of under the same uh, parent company, but they're different companies and they want different um, agreements. So uh, Google Classroom should be included under the Google umbrella. Um, and then we'll have to figure out what other uh, Google things are included under the Google umbrella as well, because that's going to be something that's going to be an issue uh, moving forward as well. Um, and this, what about something like pixel out camera system that broadcast games and the student's name comes across the broadcast screen? Um, I think that's going to fall back under other um, data privacy issues that you may have, media releases, those types of things. Um, is it student directory information? Uh, whether or not you would need to have a so pixel lock camera is under the NFHS uh, umbrella uh, network. Would you need something with that? I, I, I don't ultimately know what all information is uploaded to that. If you're uploading rosters to systems and, and all those types of things, like are those going to be a uh, situation where the pixel lock camera is just part of that implementation, not necessarily um, where the um, the broadcast and those types of things, it's going to be about the data that's part of it. Um, this is a good question, and I think there probably is something that we can do about this. So, because um, I was I was actually part of the conversation with PowerSchool. Um, PowerSchool reached out and was asking how to use the Illinois NDPA, and um, they wanted to include all of their products in Exhibit A, and they wanted to include all of their data sets for all those different products in Exhibit B. So everything in Exhibit A lists out all their products. Everything in Exhibit B lists out all their products and what data elements is associated with it. Um, there should be a way to do this. I'm trying to think 
I'm trying to think too hard about this right now. Um, <laughs> uh, but it's kind of like when my mom would ask me where my brother was and I would start thinking and I can't contact him right now. Um, but I'll cut that out of the video. Um, but I think there's a way for us to list those separately as originating agreements. So it really wouldn't be a lot of, it would, it would just take a few minutes to, to copy those agreement, copy the main agreement under a different name and then allow districts to subscribe to each one of those individually. So it would list them out individually on your resources agreements. And if, um, so if you put that question in there or if you have, um, email me um, and we'll see what we can figure out as a way to do that. Because I can see why you would want that listed instead of just PowerSchool on your site, on your resource listing, you would want it listed out individually on only the products that you're using. Um, and then there should be a way to do that. I know there's a way to do that. It's just a matter of getting that done. So we will see what we can do that. Uh, can we sign exhibit E's on version one or only one A? Yes, you can. Um, ultimately, it's up to your attorney to say whether or not they agree with version one and or version one A, um, either way. Um, so if they say, I don't agree with version one or version one A, then you can't sign exhibit E's. Um, but if if they're on board with one or one A, uh, then you can sign on to one or the other. Uh, there is um, some data errors in the system where it says that an agreement is a one A, but it's really a one. Um, and that's why you should always look at the uh, main agreement before signing on to any exhibit E's. Uh, if we have a signed exhibit E paper copy, not from the database, how do we upload that? Um, so there is a video for that. I will, uh, if we have enough time here at the end, we will do that as well. Uh, or I can show you how to do that. But ultimately, um, it's a little bit harder, but we can we can show you how to do that. Um, our PTA does school pictures and yearbooks. They, the vendors, clearly have student data that school provides. How do we handle that? That ultimately, I think, is under the school directory information. Um, exemption or FERPA law. Um, so that's something to think about there. Ultimately, again, it wouldn't hurt to have a conversation with your school pictures or your yearbooks people to find out what they're doing with that data and where it's at and who's got access to it and all those types of questions just to have those conversations like that's not a top priority but at the same time it's probably something that we should have been doing all along that we just give that information out i mean i even had thoughts about uh even with student directory information in general just like we would release that information to our uh pto and um they would have it on an Excel spreadsheet or whatever and or see this fee file and like we just gave it to random people or not random people, but the PTO people in the community that were working on the PTO to do things like the student directory and stuff like that. So it had phone numbers and addresses and all those types of things. So um, I would be aware of who you're giving information to at least have that list of things that in general to know that you're giving information to the state, you're giving information and then they're giving it on to Pearson and to WIDA and, and all these other places. And same thing with your school pictures and your books, like you're downloading CSV files and then you're sending them to uh, your yearbook company um, 
like that process, you need to have a handle on what that process is. Um, we're coming up on the hour. I just want to make sure that um, I'm going to answer, keep answering questions uh, as we go here, but just next steps, we'll get back together June 8th. If you have questions between now and then, definitely ask them, uh, schedule a meeting with me. If you want 15 minutes or 30 minutes, um, you can jump on my calendar and get in there. Um, it only schedules out for two weeks, but um, I think it, there's times available. So if you do have questions, re reach out, check out the resources, check out the YouTube playlists, uh, listen to that stuff, um, whether it's in two times speed, I mean, to get through the information, at least you will have a better understanding of what's going on with the database and the agreement and the tutorials and all those types of things. So definitely ask questions um, as, as um, between now and next, not next Tuesday, but two weeks from today. Um, so I will continue to ask, answer questions again, if you don't get your question answered or it doesn't come across as being a answer that you feel like it should be, um, please, uh, follow up with me and, and we'll get, uh, more into the specifics of what that particular thing is. Uh, Prodigy Games notified me that they will not be signing a DPA. Can I suggest to them that they sign one at the STPC website? If so, how do they do that? Um, Prodigy Games, just like any other vendor, um, ultimately, if they're not going to be signing a DPA, like they're not signing a DPA. Like if they're signing a DPA, then we can offer them the Illinois NDPA as a template. Um, I guess your the particular questions kind of circular, circular. Um, but if they want to sign an Illinois NDPA, we'd send that agreement to them. Their sample communication on the uh, resources website that you can send that Illinois NDPA template to them um, and the exhibit is there for them to be able to um, create that subscribing relationship uh, for them to sign on to, for other schools to sign on to that agreement. So it's the same for any other vendor as far as they go. Uh, some of our dual credit kids use resources with a local community college. We don't have to worry about their PII that they use with those resources. You shouldn't have to. Again, that's going to be on one of those lists that I would just have um, as a separate document that says we're sending kids to the local community college. Ultimately, they're supposed to be using their resources. They're using their uh, credentials to log into the local community college applications. They are responsible for the data. Um, if you know what those applications are that they're using, maybe there's a benefit to writing that down too, just so that you know what your students, they're still your students too. Uh, so you want to know, but you shouldn't have to have a data privacy agreement with that particular, um, with the local community college or with the applications that they're using. That should be something, it's not a requirement for the local community college, but it's something they should be aware of as well. Uh, do we need a DPA for each third party that services one of our vendors or does the vendor agreement cover third parties? We don't contract with these three par third party vendors. No, you should not need a DPA with any subcontractors of a vendor. Um, ultimately, you do want the vendor to tell you who those subcontractors are. That's a requirement of the law uh, to let you know if they're using third party um, subcontractors. Uh, are there trainings or webinars for teachers and staff to understand what SOPA is? Uh, I shared in the, in the slideshow, the, the one that we did on Mar in March, um, if other people have resources or stories to share, uh, you're more than welcome to send those to me and I can share those out during one of these as well. But, um, majority of the stuff, um, has been shared out that I'm aware of that people are using um, 
Uh, can we still use software if they don't sign the exhibit E? Um, uh, so exhibit E is just the subscribing process. So the, if the, if the software doesn't have a, an agreement, um, just making sure that we're using the right terminology here, uh, the, the full, if the software company signs a full agreement, um, that would make it SOPA compliant that they have have a data privacy agreement with the with um, a school district and then if the vendor allowed uh, an exhibit e then you could as another school district you could sign on to that and be able to use it um, whether or not so coming back to the question can we still use software if if there's no agreement Ultimately, yes, you can use anything you as a district that you want to use, but um, whether or not it falls under SOPA and what the restrictions and what the penalties for doing something like that would be, uh, whether it's for school safety or student safety or student data privacy, that's when um, you would choose not to use a particular software. Uh, how do you create a listing of the public facing site for something that does not require an agreement or something that is already on the radar? Um, we have documentation for that. I'll share that out and uh, let me answer some more questions and then I'll jump into showing you some of these things if, if you want to stick around. I use the uh, create exhibit E functionality on SDPC site, but my signature is partially or totally obscured in the new exhibit e problem am i doing it right reach out to me grab a time on my schedule and and we'll specifically look at that and if it's something i can share out um on june 8th i can do that but if you're the one that had that question um please reach out to me and schedule a time so we can look at that specifically Uh, Zoom signing a national agreement or should we contact them directly? Um, I'm not sure if Zoom's in the database at this point. I know people have reached out to them. Um, that's something I can check on for Zoom to see where we're at from that standpoint. Um, Mm, I subscribe to a school exhibit e in the database. Sometimes it does not create the originating agreement, just the exhibit e. Um, ultimately, what it should look like is the, um, again, it's probably going to be easier for me to just have you, have you reach out to me individually to show me what, what's going on so that I can share that out uh, with somebody else. Uh, what do I do if a sys won't sign the NDPA without significant changes? Can really can't really change our sys. No, and that's ultimately up to your uh, district attorney to say um, what they're willing to sign or not sign. So um, ultimately, changing the NDPA terms affects what they do in other states um, as well. So. Ultimately, terms of the, the data privacy agreement, there's there's a lot of legal stuff in there that is meant to be legal, but there's also some things in there that may be things that can be give and take uh, based on either Illinois law or, or just what your district attorney, um, your district's attorney is willing to do. So, um, definitely check with your attorney to see what those significant changes might be uh, and uh, go from there. All right, so now we're back on, and I, I'm i going to, I'll, I'll answer these questions by putting this information in another video on the linked into the YouTube video and get these sent out. Um, that'll be faster than, trying to work my way through this um, under pressure. So I will definitely get those answers for you. Um, uh, what if we do if the school admin tells you not to worry about SOPA, just get a website up and um, yeah, I'm not gonna answer that. Uh, 
but that's up to you to work that out. <laughs> I'm glad that's anonymous and you're not sharing that information out, but um, have them have them have them take it up with their legislature or I mean, I, I shouldn't even have said that. Um, yeah, do what you need to do. <laughs> All right. Thank you for your time. Uh, look forward to seeing you all again June 8th. Have a good uh, couple weeks off here. Enjoy your holiday weekend.